of Paris, where the book is on cross-cultural connections through cinema. She's held a variety of media roles in the US and Europe, including Media Con CBS, Nickelodeon, anonymous content, and a cultural services of the Missy While she was a student at Columbia, her feature film script, Ratka, was optioned by BAFTA nominated producer San Fu Malta. Ange is her directorial debut in the US France co production of Human City on the Festival Circuit in December of 2022. She's currently developing her next film, Women Sans et le Bon Feu Don, to be shot in Paris, and she'll begin filming a narrative series called De Vaita, Objects of Affection in New York next month. We're going to be, Jasmine's going to be joined by Roxanne Varzi, who is a writer, artist, filmmaker, playwright, and a full professor of anthropology at the University of California at Irvine. She, she is also, uh, was also a student at Columbia, where she got her PhD in anthropology. And she was the first Fulbright scholar to Iran after the revolution, as well as a Woodrow Wilson scholar and the youngest distinguished senior Iranian visiting fellow at St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. Professor Rosie is the author of Boring Souls, Media, Martyrdom, and Youth in Post Revolution Iran, and Last Seen Underground, an ethnographic novel of Iran, which garnered the independent publisher's gold medal in 2016. She also created a film, Plastic Flowers Never Die, and several multimedia sound and video projects, including Whole World Blind, No Wings to Fly to God, and Salt and Sublime, that address subjects of war and climate change. She's published a number of short stories and several plays. Her first play, Splinters of a Careless Alphabet, about French philosopher Henry Corbin and the Iranian Revolution, is being developed as a graphic novel. And her second play, Yalda in the Iranian Twelfth Night, was recently directed by Eli Simon in a reading at the New Swan Shakespeare Center at the University of California, Irvine. So, Jasmine, do you just want to say a quick word of welcome before we, um, before we start your movie? She one time convinced her friends that they keep like the, the money that they didn't have to they didn't have to return to the school and buy books with it. And this to me just um, it seemed cinematic in my in my head when I when I heard it. And you know I have background as a screenwriter. I've written feature like screenplays. And for a while I had been searching for a story which could be a short film in which I could direct. And you know short films are great and they're also challenging because you have it's not so much about character development, particularly in a piece of this length. It's about a twist or an unexpected turn which can make a point to your viewer. And so when I heard that story, I knew that um, that I had found the, the right means to finally write a short film and direct it. So why that particular historic event? I think it's a combination of various things. I mean, I was very struck by the fact that this event, the visit of Georges Pompidou happened in 1968, which is a significant year for many reasons. Of course, the student protests starting in France, which spread all over the world, including at Columbia. I'm sure as many of you know, Columbia has a very significant history with the 1968 student protests. I also love the idea of paying tribute to the French 
lycée system because I think it's something so unique about French culture and is the reason why French literature, culture, and art is so strong because you can find that in any country. Um, and you know, I also wanted to pay tribute to um, Farah Drew Parsa, who was the Minister of Education. She became Minister of Education in Iran in 1968. She was a militant feminist. She was one of the first to fight for women's suffrage in Iran. And actually, uh, my grandfather, Sia Mekhrugan, worked in the Ministry of Education and worked for her. And my mom also would tell me stories about um, seeing uh, Khanum Parsa and her interactions with her. Um, and for those who, who don't know, she was actually ex executed by firing squad in 1980. Um, she was a, a doctor in addition to being a, a teacher and the first ever uh, female member of cabinet. And um, in her letter to her children before being executed, she said that as a doctor, she wasn't afraid of death because death was a moment, but that she wouldn't be willing to step back in history and uh, revert um, 50 years of progress. There's clearly a lot of context. I'm wondering if you want to expand this into a feature-length film, or if there was ever a moment where you thought maybe you should make the feature-length film? It's a great question. I think starting off, I was very much set on this being a six-minute film because I could see the terms of the story in my mind. That being said, I think there's a lot um, about the French and Iranian relationship which could be expanded into a feature film, and I could see a situation where you know, we follow Nilou Farah as she ages, as she grows, and as she becomes a, a confident and creative young woman. So why did you choose the Girl Scouts in particular, and not just the whole sort of school system? Well, so because the, this community service week was something that the Girl Scouts, or a Farish did, did in particular, and so that was the story that my mom told me. And for those who don't know, by the way, Farish did, which was the name of the Girl Scouts in Iran, uh, means angels, so that's why the film is called Ange. And was it difficult to find a space that sort of felt like Iran? And did you ask your mom if it looked like Razi? <laughs> I'm an anthropologist, so everything for me like has to have sort of a feel. Or right. So candidly, the Lycée Razi had a very specific architecture that I know you would not find outside of the Middle East. But it was it was very difficult to find this space, particularly because we shot this in November 2020 during COVID. So my producer Josh remembers this well. But um, we went to a lot of schools in the city and asked if we could film there, and we received a lot of very kind responses saying, we ordinarily would love to welcome you, but our health license won't permit an external group of people to come in. So I wasn't really sure what to do, and I realized that, you know, what other spaces might be older buildings and might also have a classroom, so I thought of churches. So I started randomly emailing churches um, in the city and also Long Island. One responded to me, one reverend, um, and I set up a call with her, a meeting, and she said, she was a young reverend, and she said I used to be a film student before joining the church, so I'd be happy to help out and uh, let you guys film in the church. That's wonderful. So I thought I'd open it up to the audience if there are any questions that the audience has. Everything you can do with the major in French, becoming a movie director. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a question about La Princesse de Clé. Yes. Right? It seems a little out of a uh, sink, right? It's a hard movie for those yes. who don't know anything. Mm -hmm. uh, what are they? Why did they really that book? What, what do you want to, you know, uh, to to show? I must say that oh, there is a recent history. I don't know if you're aware. Yes. With La Princesse de Clé in France yes. and Sarkozy yes. saying, uh, who cares? About <laughs> play, yeah. which is a, a French Catholic, right? But the former French president uh, who was not, let's say, very fond of French literature uh, <laughs> said, uh, "Who cares about that book? We don't need to. People don't need to read that book in order to be, you know, uh, efficient workers." So I, I want to have your, uh, you have your, have your explanation on this choice. Thank you. Absolutely. So for me, La Princesse de Clèves is absolutely the strongest feminist symbol that I could think of. And you're right that it's certainly a very advanced book for these girls to be reading. So to me, that choice showed that Nilufar is precocious and is beyond her years. And that's why she's trying to convince her friends, the other students, to join her in this world that she's exploring. And I was, of course, very aware of uh, Sarkozy's recent comments. And so it was my hope that this film, in a way, could be kind of a continuation of showing the continued relevance of La Princesse de Clèves. Hi, I really love the style of the film. I couldn't help thinking about French cinema as well as uh, some of the works of uh, Avostas, 
2007, where you, um, you had a specific image in mind for the person you wrote for the job? Absolutely. So as we all know, Iranian films are, are so uh, world-renowned right now, and um, I think it's something that's very wonderful. That being said, most of the films, the Iranian films, are speaking about the problems in Iran today. And so it was really my goal to use Andre as an opportunity to show the Iran of the past, of the history, but quite recent history. And so that being said, it was very important to me that the film be colorful and bright and warm and welcoming. Um, so in terms of you know color references, you can probably tell that Amelie was a strong reference. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth by Guillermo del Toro was also a reference in terms of not only the kind of uh, mystical and wondrous side of it, which I tried to bring in here in a subtle way, but also the fact that it's a young girl um, discovering her her future and um, losing herself in a book. Talk about just the casting process and like how you worked with. I know these kids are pretty young, right? So how was it working with them? Are any of them actors, or are they all you know freshly acting here? It was a great process working with the kids. So I necessarily wasn't seeking um, professional actors because the priority was, of course, that they be fluent in French, and also it's more of a European naturalistic style of acting. So I didn't necessarily want kids who are very trained actors. Um, I found our main actress by posting on a Facebook group, French Parents of New York and New Jersey. <laughs> and so um, I received audition tapes that way. Hers was the first tape I saw. I loved it. And the girl with the glasses is actually her little sister. Um, and they both were wonderful. And, then, and they come from a French family, so growing up speaking French at home, so that was very easy for them. And then the, um, the other, other third young actress with the blonde hair, she is a professional actress, and she was great as well. And the teacher, um, again, I, I needed someone who was French, so he's not a trained actor, he's actually a chiropractor, um, but he comes from a French family, and it's, it was really great to work with, too. Any other questions? Yes. Um, hi. Yeah, so um, I like to answer these questions very honestly because I think when you don't answer them honestly, it's not helpful for anyone. So I um, also was working full-time as a journalist at the time, and I, I did fund this film myself. And part of the reason, frankly, for you know the length was the challenge of making a story in a shorter amount of time, but also of keeping the quality um, of the production very high. What did you shoot it on? Um, I sh we shot it on an Alexa XT+. Plus. Did you guys do the post-production yourself? Um, so the post-production was a little bit of everywhere. Um, our editor, uh, Sean Anon, was actually also um, a Columbia student, uh, class of 2021. This was the first film he ever edited, following which he now works full-time as an editor, which is wonderful. Um, he also was on set and was very, very close to the story. Uh, for the coloring, I worked with someone in the UK who's actually like, an in-house color um, you know, color grader at the Tate Museum in London. And the sound was actually done at a studio in Argentina um, where there was a French uh, sound mixer on staff. And I, I have one more question while we're passing the mic around. You purposely chose not to put any Persian in except for the June and sort of the affectionate. So that's, yes. that was an interesting um, choice as well because I would guess that they would be bilingual while they're outside and playing and sort of speaking among each other. Or, I don't know, was that something you got from your mom that they may not have spoken at school bilingually to each other or slipped into Persian here and there? From what I understand, they necessarily um, wouldn't. And you might have no noticed too that it's a very diverse looking group of girls. Uh, I mean, like the, one of the girls, for example, in the main three is blonde. So it was meant to be a mixture of maybe, you know, um, students of diplomats, students of foreign business people, um, and also Iranian students who were being sent to the French school. Um, you know, as a broader point for me as, a, as an artist and filmmaker, my goal is to use the French language as a bridge between different cultures. And I think that's one of the strongest influences that I had working at the cultural services of the French Embassy because we hosted authors and artists from all around the world uh, creating their works in French. So very much so I would say that the French language is meant to be the main character of this film. I think there was another question. Oh, there we go. 
Thank you so much. So, of course, yes, I chose that passage from La Princesse de Clèves to make a parallel about looking at the portrait. And I think for me, um, Nilofer looking up at the portrait, portraits of the Shah and uh, Pompidou is to show that she's maybe defiant in a slightly, in a positive way. She's making her own legacy. She's, you know, spreading her influence uh, among her among her class, among her uh, among her colleagues. And I would say in terms of the song, that's a wonderful question. So it's a funny story. The, that song, uh, Melim, came out also during the pandemic. And it was actually one of the selections from Tehran for a chanson de l'année. And so I was listening to it while I was writing the, the script. And of course, the title is in, is in Turkish. And I found out later, I finally Google, uh, researched what the title meant. And it means my angel in Turkish. And actually, um, I have a, my, my grandmother has an Azerbaijani and Turkish background as well. So for me, that song very much represents multicultural France in a very modern way. Um, he's Algerian, he's singing with Daju, who's from the Congo, and it's a song which has done well in many, many countries. So I decided to make the active choice to put that song at the end as a way to, again, pay tribute to the power the French language has to bring people from all around the world together and also to bring the film into the present day. I think that's the, one of the most interesting things is how um, making a historic film, you still comment on the, the with Sarkozy and the music, that you're still bringing it into the context of the current situation. And I think it's almost impossible to contain history in such a way that we would make something that's completely of that moment. So it's, it's interesting that you're quite aware of that and that you're actually putting in these moments that are contemporary. It's definitely a very um, deliberate goal of mine because I think even history in and of itself is fluid because history is something that we're constantly experiencing and revisiting. And you know, speaking very frankly, as the child of Iranian immigrants raised in the US, of course you're used to hearing so many things and so many preconceived notions about Iran. I mean, I remember when I was, again, working at the, at the embassy, we hosted uh, Negar Javadi, a French Iranian author. And, one thing that she said which very much struck me is that Iran is a country that everyone thinks they know everything about it already, but in fact there's so many sides of it that they don't know. And so I decided very much with this film that I wanted to show my Iran that I know from my family, from my, from my parents, from the culture that I was raised with, um, because it's something that I really hadn't seen represented in cinema, despite the many uh, very talented Iranian filmmakers who are making their mark on the world today. Well, it's also very Iranian. I think um, Farouk Farouk who was a filmmaker from the 70s, made a film about a leper colony, but it was really about what was going on in the 70s, or 60s, sorry, 68. And then you have Simin Donishvar, who writes his book, Savashun, which is really about World War II, presumably, but it's really about the 70s. So often people deploy history when they're not able to talk about the present moment, whether it's censorship or for whatever reason. So it's interesting that, that, that you're carrying on that legacy in some ways. Absolutely. I mean, it's a very, I, I've heard once that, you know, as a filmmaker, your first film is always your story in one way or another. And I would say that that's absolutely true. I mean, on a personal note, I was raised with French culture as much as Iranian culture, and I have Honestly, I frequently gravitated more towards the French culture. And then working at, at the cultural services, I met not only you know Iranian authors living in France, but I, I met uh, Mathieu Senor, the Goncourt winner um, for Boussole. And I remember him visiting the embassy and being able to speak with him in Farsi and realizing, you know, as an artist, this is a part of myself that I really need to embrace and dig deeper into. And that was one of my questions originally, I think, that we talked about is, is it something that you've purged? <laughs> Sometimes we have to purge that first thing 
that's just going to continue to haunt us until we get rid of it? Or is it something that you want to continue? Which is goes back to my question about making a longer film about the same topic. I think it's absolutely something that I'm going to continue to explore. I mean, definitely in the in my projects that I'll be doing in the near future, I'm again using the French language to, to explore the connections between different cultures. And I think there's still so much more that can be said about Iran that hasn't been said already, particularly in this very dynamic moment that we're living in. I think one thing about Iranian culture too is there's so many different iterations of it right now because there's the diaspora, there's the people that are currently in Iran, and there's also a distance there. And so I'm also working on a film that will explore that distance and how we can try and bridge it. Sounds good, I saw another hand, yes. Oh, um, well, I did, yeah, I wanted to see this film just continue. <laughs> I hope that you will make it continue, but uh, were you obsessed with this book as a child? Or as a teenager? Yes, it was one of the books I read um, when I was about uh, 13 or 14, and which always led, left such a strong impression with me, particularly because it is the first historical novel of its kind and written by a woman, so it, it's a very, very strong symbol. Any more questions about film? Yeah. Are you submitting to film festivals? Um, yes, so it debuted on the festival circuit in uh, July 2020. Our first festival was in Germany. Um, and uh, July 2022, sorry, it debuted in the festival circuit in July 2022, this past summer. And um, it's been accepted to about 15 festivals so far. We have a few more coming up in 2023, which I can't talk about yet. But yes, we have been able to share the film all over the world. I mean, I attended festivals in Germany, Italy. Um, there was a great festival in New York, New York Shorts. It screened in Cyprus. It won the Best Director Prize at the Children's Film Festival of Wales. So. I was really touched by the fact that it's something that we travel to a lot of different countries. Any more questions? All right, well this is kind of a strange transition, but I was asked to come in and talk a little bit about the French context in terms of my own work, which is kind of a complete departure in some ways. Um, and I don't really want to give an academic paper, but I will talk a little bit about um, sort of my interest in, in the French in Iran. And, um, and yeah, it's a completely different direction. So I um, began as an anthropologist 20 years ago to look at post-revolution Iran, which is a very different space. And I read philosopher Henri Corbin, who at the time I found to be a very interesting theorist of, of not just Islam, but a particular kind of Islam that was read through Hegel and Kojeb. This is such a different direction to go in. So I'm just going to dispense with my academic paper and make this a little bit more conversational. So anyway, so I was really interested in Corbin in terms of theory. French theory, whatever. It was Islamic theory for me. But then I began to dig deeper years later, and I found that Corbin's not just a theorist, but he was somebody who spent a lot of time teaching in Iran. So the French um, sort of education system goes back to the Lazarus missionaries in the 1850s. They came in and they set up schools like Razi, Jean d'Arc, which famously trained Farah Diba, the, the, the queen of Iran, the former queen, who went on to do a lot of really amazing things in terms of literacy, education, and um, also the French language was the main language in Iran in the secondary school system until World War II when the English language started taking over. So even last week I was teaching the 1953 coup in class and I was showing some interviews and my students said, why are these people speaking French? And I said, well, because they were trained in French and it was the diplomatic language and it was the court language. So French was really important, but I think the thing that's really important to think about as well is that the French were studying Iran at the same time that they were teaching in Iran. So the French were the main architects, the main archeologists, they were the people who were coming in and giving infrastructure and structure but they were also incredibly interested in Iran as an object of study in terms of Islam as well. So this is a completely different direction. But so Henri Corbin comes into Iran, he's a continental philosopher. The Shah of Iran is one of the first people that he meets when he comes in in the 70s, well, 50s, he comes in in the 50s, he stays through the 60s. 
He sets up a center for philosophy. And the Shah says, why aren't you teaching Western philosophy? And Henri Corbin says, because I'm really interested in Islamic philosophy. And he's really interested in Shiism in particular. So he sets up the philosophical center and he teaches the exact same class that he taught in Paris in Tehran. So you're getting this really interesting exchange where somebody who is this important continental philosopher comes to Iran and starts teaching Iranians in the 70s about Islam as not a practice, but as a philosophical, theoretical entity. But what, yeah, go ahead. Yes, both. So Henri Corbin in particular, the difference. Oh, how much time do we have? So he's interested. So Henri Corbin is interested in Ismailism. He's interested in Twelver Shiism. And he is very much, becomes very much somebody who is, is writing about Sufism in particular. He was a student of Louis Maxignon, who was this very important Catholic, albeit um, philosopher of Islam at the Sorbonne. He was trained under him at Tegelsen, but he really is interested in Sufism. At the same time, though, he's debating clerics in Rome. So he's also very interested in the practice of Islam in the 70s. And this is really important, and it's something that people don't really think about, and they don't talk about. And I think what's really important about Corbin is he was teaching at the Sorbonne in 68, and at the same time, the Shah was sending over college students to Paris and to various other places at the same time, right? So they're studying in France when all of this is happening, but at the same time, Corbin's going back and forth. So you have, um, at the time, you have somebody like Ali Shariati, who is a student of both Corbin and Massignon, and he is also exchanging letters with Franz Fanon. So what's happening in the 60s is that the French political culture, the really important anti-colonial political culture, is coming into Iran through people like Shariati and Corbin. Not purposefully with Corbin. Corbin is just there as an Islamist. He's just teaching philosophy. His goal is not at all political, but he does something really important at the time. If you could imagine that you have this incredible French system, people really look to Paris as the place where, you know, that's like the intellectual compass just points right there. And you have somebody who comes into Tehran in the 70s and puts the French stamp of approval on Islamic studies. And this is huge. This is really important. So this is kind of what I'm looking at, and <laughs> it brings it a little bit you know, into the present moment, but I think it's really important as an anthropologist to understand that philosophy is moving in both ways, that it isn't something that's just happening where France is bringing in this amazing you know, Lycée culture and everything else, but that the French are also looking at Iran and they're changing the ways in which the Iranians are practicing Islam, Sufism is becoming more popular through Korban, and as Sufism becomes more popular, Khomeini picks up on this discourse, and he uses it, for better or worse. And it's not an intention of Korban's. As a matter of fact, Korban and Khomeini cross paths. But it's a, I think it's really important. So this is, this is a lot of what I've been studying in terms of French relationships. And of course, we have Michel Foucault, another famous French philosopher, who's reading Corbin, who's talking about how in this moment where we have rapid industrialization, we have this anti-colonial moment, we have this promise of something spiritual. And so the French intellectuals are picking up on this. I mean, not in droves, you know, and Foucault regretted it. He went and he got his megaphone and he went and he was on the front lines and immediately asked for all of his writings to be burned. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, yes, exactly, yes, of course, yes. Yes, madness and civilization, all of that. So it's interesting that he would be interested in spirit when he was so absolutely, um, you know, against Catholicism in particular. Well, I think also, you know, France has a history of being a host to Iranians of many varying beliefs, yes. whether that's political or religious. 
I mean, of course, right now, you know, France is the is home to um, Farah, the former Shah, but also yes. was home to Khomeini while he was planning the revolution. That was the next place I was going. <laughs> so that's one of the um, kind of funny contradictions that exists in this very complex relationship between France and Iran. But I think we can say maybe it's strange to say that it's it's something that, which has always been enriched in both ways. Like you're saying, even going back to Sarah Gehedaya in the early 21st century, you know, Iran's probably his, his, Iran's most significant modern author who was living and working and writing in France. And buried, buried in And buried in Kalashis. Absolutely. But it, I mean, also as an anthropologist, when I landed in Iran, one of the only cultural organizations to continue to be active in Iran is the French. Um, cultural organization. As a matter of fact, I watched the World Cup at the French consulate, which was really exciting because I thought if, if France wins, we're going to get champagne. <laughs> which was like, I kept thinking, I hope they win. But I think, you know, this is something that's also really important is that there's been this continuity. And I think that regardless of what's happening politically, there's been this constant um, interest, this constant exchange to this day the um, university exam is called the concours. The system is very strong. My aunt was actually the principal of um, Iran Suisse, which was the Swiss school in Iran, and she spoke French at home mostly. But it's just, it's a very, very important um, history that's, that's continued. But I think it's important to um, think about how it's, it, it's not in a vacuum, and it's, it's constantly moving and uncontained. Right, and going back to the history of film, I mean, the first, uh, it was uh, employees of Gomong who brought film to Iran for the first time and shot the first films there. And even the director of uh, The Red Balloon, he was working on a documentary in Iran when he was, when he died in a, in a helicopter accident, he was commissioned by the Shah. So even just going back to the very beginning of the history of film in Iran, it's a very, very fruitful and rich relationship. Yeah, the Qajars had one of the first Lumiere cameras, and they were the first people to be in the audience there as well. Um, yeah, and a lot of um, filmmakers in Iran were trained in Paris in the 60s. So anyway, just to, just to broaden and open <laughs> some things up, I had a PowerPoint, but I, I think we've probably hit on all of the images at this point. Any, any other questions or? It's okay. Today, right, and how the French language is being 
Jews and French culture being Jew in Iran, because obviously the Iranian revolution was also a populist revolution to a large extent, right? So it was like we, I mean, I understand that you know people might um, you know have uh, appreciated <laughs> what Michel Foucault said after the revolution, and that, oh yes, there is this side of France of the anti-colonial, the anti-Enlightenment, right, uh, side, but there is this other side that is. Um, bourgeois and you know and that you don't want that right so I, I'm just wondering is this, this is the case today or what is the status of France in terms of thinking about class distinctions in Iran through the history of the 20th century and today? It's a great question. Do you want to? Yes, I mean I think um, <laughs> I think in Iran uh, particularly pre-revolution there of course is an association that if you you know, are going to be educated if you're going to be intellectual and really understand history, culture, literature on a broad scale, that the French language is absolutely a must. That being said, I don't think it's something that was necessarily inaccessible. I mean, I know that there were many avions Francaises in Iran, and it was something that people often would gravitate more towards French than towards English even, as Professor Barzi said. And I think even today, the relationship between Iran and France because it's multidimensional, as we have as we have covered, that exchange in terms of you know language and film and art remains much more open. Well, I think because it started with missionaries, um, there was already um, sort of a large class space. So, and then it became what happened was when it moved into Tehran, it narrowed a little bit more as we're getting toward the fifties and sixties. But from the very beginning, um, one of the things that the Shah really cared about was the education system, and that always meant French. <laughs> so there was a wide base. And then the other thing is he gave so many scholarships to people across the board to go and study in France. And I think that's part of why you get people who have these anti-colonial, anti-class sentiments is because they're coming from these classes, right? And they're, they're recognizing themselves, even though they're in this context that they've been trained in sort of the French system or later on at a French university, which is really interesting. So in some ways, he trained his opposition, you know? Um. <laughs> that being said, I think going back to the choice of La Princesse de Club, that's why it was really important for me in the film for there to be a symbol of French culture and literature, which is clearly chosen by the girls themselves and is not what is being imposed on them by their teacher. You know, even though the speech that the teacher gives at the beginning about, you know, France and Iran and the relationship and then being the product of this relationship is very nice, but it was really essential that I show them questioning what they're being told, even if it's something which is comforting and is encouraging. Because of course at this time in 1968 in Iran, female education was very much encouraged, it was open. I mean, again, like I said, the uh, first ever female cabinet uh, pr uh, minister, the Minister of Education was elected, but they still um, are not blindly accepting what they're being told, and they're turning to the Princess de Club, which is a very specific symbol in order to craft their own, their own futures. They're also, you know, in the Khazar court as well, the princesses were trained by French tutors. So some of the early diaries that we have, like Taj al Sultanet, are written in French, which is really interesting, just on the feminist. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? So, I mean, I think on a very basic scale, a, a tree is something which is rooted in one place, but is nourished by elements that may come from across the world or across across the ocean. I mean, going back to Abbas Kiarostami, he said that he never left Iran because a tree, um, he was a tree that already was rooted too deeply. And so I wanted to acknowledge the strength of Iranian culture um, with the symbol of the tree while also pointing out that it's being nourished by, you know, exchange and communication with French culture as well as others. Any other questions?
have you thought about doing a diasporic, um, <laughs> have you thought about doing the reverse and doing a diasporic film about Iranians in France? I have actually, I think that um, in my vision of this kind of story, it's worth to link the diaspora together, Iranians. And I mean, even by myself, I have family, France, Canada, United States, all over. So I think in order to really explore the status and the definition of what it means to be Iranian today, there's many, many different threads that are interconnected, interwoven together that we need to explore and untangle. Any other questions? series that I will be shooting next month is called uh, Dvaita, Objects of Affection. It was also written by a recent Columbia alumnus, and um, it follows the breakdown of a relationship between an Indian American couple in their 20s and also addresses questions of culture and modernity in the past. Um, and following this, um, I have a short film I've written, which this one will be in French, Le Médecin de Pontreton, which follows the, a young uh, Korean neurologist who's moved to Paris to start his uh, re uh, fellowship at the PT saint Pantero Hospital. And he meets a patient of his, an elderly Japanese woman with Alzheimer's. And this encounter catapults him into a world between fantasy and reality. So it's very much in the realm of magical realism. Thank you so much for, uh, for pointing that out. I mean, absolutely, I think uh, Marja and Satrapi is probably the most beautiful example we have so far of French and Iranian uh, cultural communication. And uh, First Police is a beautiful work of art, which is also very much her story. Um, so it was certainly a very strong influence and a good basis to have in terms of knowing that it's possible to create a work of art about Iran, which is entirely in French, as she did. <laughs>